basically it's the same. You know, the, you know how a chopper pump works. It's this the leading edge of the impeller turning across this stationary cutter bar. All right, and that's that's what's breaking down all the solid as it comes into the pump. Right, um, and then on the back side, your first pumps didn't have it. Your your one of your replacement pumps does have they have we have a uh, upper cutter what we call an upper cutter, and basically what that's doing it's using these pump out veins as a female corresponding piece on the on the upper cutter, so you got a tight, almost like what you have out here, a tight uh, like a wiper. So if you get some stray solids, the idea is to prevent the, uh, the the small solids that get around the impeller from reweaving and wrapping around the shaft and getting up into the seal. Um, the uh, on the front we got what they call a cutter nut. It's a keyed on shaft, so the impeller is held on with this nut. The other thing that does is it's got a weld on it, which acts as a wiper for the ends of these cutter bar segments. So it's um, it, it, as you know, it's it's not even though we're chopping, it's it's more of the torque. It's not cutting, even though the impellers when they come in they're sharp, and if you go to replace one. I did one last week and nicked my fingers up pretty good. It was that sharp. They, you know, they round over time, but it still chops because it's the torque of the motor doing that shearing action. The other thing that's different uh, from your old pumps, we use a cartridge seal now with its an oil-filled uh, housing in there. Your original pumps were packing, and then we went to we use the uh, two-piece seals, like the uh, uh, the, the uh, be uh, be bellow seals with the sewing carbide faces, and you had to put one first the stationary part and then the rotating and get the compression on that. This all comes, the seal, the housing, the uh, seal sleeve all comes as one piece. So pull the, uh, pull the pump out, take the impeller off and that whole cartridge comes out and the new one goes in. Same as your old pumps, bearing housing is oil filled. And that, that's all the major parts. So these are your wear parts. Cutter bar, impeller, as you guys know, and the upper cutter. Uh, depending on the on the service, is going to dictate how long those rest those last. I think on your the six inch pump we put in over here, it's it's pretty light duty. Should should go years. The average across the board is four to seven years on life of those parts. And these truck unloading pumps, it has been in the past uh, considerably less because just the wear and tear. You don't know what's coming off those trucks and just can really beat up the pumps. Um, routine operation, these are, you know, how they've been operating before. I guess the, tr the driver comes in, hits a button. The driver comes in, drops a load, grab it, drops a load into a yep. storage tank, and there's a, there's a level element there that shuts off the pump. Turns, turns on and shuts off the pump. Okay. Okay, so we didn't do any of the instrumentation on that, so I'm not sure on that end of it. Um, so routine operation is, is on the driver, right? He comes in, fires it up, dumps his load, the pump comes on, pump goes off. Okay, it's a, it's a constant speed, there's no VFDs. I don't know if there's a soft start on this or not. Yeah, typically there isn't. So there's not, there's not much to the uh, routine operation. Uh, routine maintenance. Most of it is, is like, you, you know, your, your inspections. There's a sight glass, which will show you when you go down the basement on the housing. That should be half full. So you got, uh, you know, basically you want the uh, oil to, from the bottom, from no more than halfway up the, uh, the shaft. So you can just that's just a visual inspection you do whenever you're in the area. Uh, also on the uh, seal cartridge, this has got about four four ounces of oil I think on your model. Twice a year, it's a good idea. You can't really see it on this. But there's a couple of plugs. There's also a, a, a vent on this, so if it does build up some pressure will vent out to atmosphere, but because you're going to get some leak seepage through the seal, so that you're going to get some material in there, and, and uh, it's probably a good idea if you can. Most people don't, but if you can twice a year, just to drain out that oil and uh, replace it. The bearing housing uses a turbine oil. You can use the same in that, or you can use a hydraulic oil on this one. This is just, there's no bearings in here, so the type of oil is not as critical. It's also a uh, good idea to quarterly take uh, amperage, record them, so you can track the pump, see how it's performing. It's uh, as it gets wear over time, 
those amps should go up. Or if you get some binding in here, something, something's binding around the shaft, you got some, you got a gap in here, and it's binding between the impeller and the cutter bar. Those amps are going to go up. So if you can track those, you'll give you a good idea of when you need to uh, service the pumps. The other thing on these versus the original is when you got some wear in here, you could take take the pump out of the uh, plumbing, take this apart, and take out some of those paper shims they used to have on it. This new one is a uh, back pull out, so the volute stays in the in the piping. Okay, so if you have to get to um, the impeller, the cutter bar, the mechanical seal, you uh, leave the volute in the piping and use these bolts here and do that, and then take the whole rotating assembly out. The other thing that this does is it lets you externally adjust that gap between the impeller and the cutter bar. When they come new from the factory, there are 12 to 15,000 spacing, somewhere in like that. Uh, over time, if the pump performance drops down, <coughs> excuse me, you get some binding. You can, use an, you can see it better on the uh, pump downstairs, but you can use these adjusting clamps to close, back up the, that close that gap back up. So hopefully it'll extend the time between replacing the the uh, impeller and the cutter bar. Same thing with the upper cutter. Those adjustments are on the back side of the bearing housing and that adjusts the gap between the upper cutter and the back of the impeller. Basically what you do is you, uh, you, back, you pick three of these. There's, there's six or eight depending on the model of the pump around the uh, volute. You pick three of them, you back the other ones out of the way. Pick, you mark the um, one, of the one of the points on the adjusting bolt and the casing, and then you turn it counterclockwise, one flat. Right. Tighten them back up, spin it, you know, you take off that guard between the motor and the pump, spin it, it still turns freely, go back and do it again, counterclockwise, one flat. You keep doing that until you get a metal to metal, I shouldn't be doing that, until you get a metal to metal on that, and then you take the adjustment bolts and you turn them clockwise one flat. That will set it back to the factory tolerance. So it's, a ni it's much nicer. You don't have to deal with those paper shims. And these are O-rings in here. Um, parts on that, you've got spare impellers and cutter bars, spare mechanical seals, spare bearings, and all the O-rings. Uh, after that, uh, these, these parts are all stocked. So if you need them overnight, you can get them overnight, second day, uh, UPS ground, however you like them. They don't obsolete their parts, they keep a $2 million inventory. So even on pumps, even on your old pumps, pumps 15 years, that design error, we can still get the parts for them. So, and the big thing obviously is, or the big concern is this is, you guys know this, this is a chaffer pump and you get your fingers in here. I mean, I know you, yeah, they're gone. So even if you follow, you know, you follow your lockout procedures, if this is ragged up or something and it's, and it's jammed up. You can be enough spring in there that when you free that rag, that's going to spin back on you and take off the tips of your fingers. So, you know, use a pl pliers or a screwdriver or whatever and pull it out. Oh, you know, you've seen these pumps. The uh, maintenance on the motor, it's grease. You give it a couple of squirts once a quarter. That's in the O&M. Oh, we'll go through the O&M manual. Um, whenever you need to order parts, you can go through us or you can go directly to Vaughn. In the O&M manual, there's a, um, oh, the, uh, it's got the curves in there, so it gives you your operating point. We changed the, uh, uh, this from the old pumps a little bit. It's a newer version. Uh, we've gone from 15 to 20 horse. The reason that is we're, it's putting us on this, uh, on this pump, which is a little more efficient to begin with, but it's putting us on a better spot in the curve. So if something happens, like your suction line is you know, choking off a little bit or it's real heavy, so you don't have that suction head, you're not going to go off the curve so easily. You're not going to start cavitating, hopefully. These are all certified factory curves, too. In tab four, there's a, they call it a maintenance summary that gives you uh, serial numbers, a model. If you ever contact, uh, I will know, but if you ever contact Vaughn, the first thing they're going to want is a serial number. These two pumps are the same serial number, they're just differentiated by B and A. The last, last uh, Last character on the serial number will be B or A. Other than that, they're identical. It also gives you, this uh, section gives you your uh, lubricants, types, quantities. Next tab, five, it's got the, um, 
your list of equipment, all your spare parts, what you're here and signed over. Drawings. And I'm looking for bill of materials. Section six has got a complete breakdown on all the parts with the part numbers on it. So for ordering spare parts, you got that. Um, it's also got uh, exploded view drawings, which has got the item number so you can pick out the part you think you need to replace and re cross-reference it to the bill of materials. Again, you can, uh, you can contact us for spare parts. You can go directly to Vaughn. Vaughn's out in the West Coast, so they're 3 o'clock. Well, no, it's the other way around. They're 10 o'clock our time. They're open, and they'll be open until uh, 6 o'clock our time. And again, most all these are stock parts. You know, once in a while they they have a uh, you know they run out, and it's a couple of weeks to get the uh, new castings in on, on things like the casings. But typically, the impellers, the cutter bars, seals, are all in stock, so you can have them as you need them. I think the first time you uh, if you want us to come down, maybe after they've been serviced six months or a year, if you want to adjust these that gap between the impeller and the cutter bar, have, one, have someone from my group come down and can walk you through it. It's real easy to do, but it's real easy to screw up, and uh, the important thing is that you go in square, so you got to do those three separate adjusters, the same rotation. If you have two people doing it at the same time, uh, I'll bet you 100 bucks one guy's going to go clockwise, the next guy's going to go counterclockwise. And you'll be, we, it just happened to me last week. Uh, and you'll have to start over. O&Ms are in here. The motor, it's a Westinghouse motor. It's a, a C-face. You'll see on the pump down there, it's got a, uh, the, the piece between the motor and the pump called a uh, motor stool, and it's piloted for C-face motors. All right, so there's no alignment. You don't have to go in there with a laser alignment or calipers or anything. It just it centers the two shafts, and it's, uh, it's connected by a TB Woods uh, uh, Triflex coupling. So if that motor burned out down the road and you got a better deal on it, you don't have to get the motor to Vaughn, first of all. you got motor shops all around the place. If you want to replace it with a Baldor or a U.S. motor or Toshiba or whoever, just use that frame size and make sure it's C-faced and it'll, it'll fit right in, no alignment. This is, this is a, a, a nice pump to work on you know, versus the, uh, the early ones because, again, it's that back pullout. You can leave the, the uh, volute right in the uh, pipeline. You got that external adjustment, no more paper shims. The seal's a lot easier to uh, put in. And, and that, I mean, that's about it. There's not a lot of, there's no alignment with the pump. It's either stuff goes in and stuff goes out. Right? Uh, when it stops going out, someone's got to. It was too thick to pump for. Well, you know, yeah. the. You, you guys never know what you're getting, right? I mean. Well, yeah, you get at least 4% salt. Yeah. Um, with any centrifugal pump, particularly if the sludge is polymerized, mm -hmm. yeah. you got a point where the, the suction oh, yeah. on it, you know, it just is not going to flow to the pump. This does have some suction, but it's, it's not like a self priming pump. Yeah. So we need, you need some because good suction head. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, you can almost see it coming, it starts shaking a little bit. And, yeah. Those. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we went to this on, on this curve and also um, why we want to run it uh, relatively slow. This is turning at 1170, you know, some of our pumps are 1750, and that heavy stuff, it's, for this type of pump anyway, it's better to uh, run it slower, you get less wear and tear, and it's more tolerant of that cavitation. When that, one of the things that will happen when you do that, you get into that heavy stuff, if the pump's cavitating, you may open up on the uh, mechanical seal, the seal faces. Heat. Well, you, what, what would happen is the, the pumps vibrating, cavitating, and those the uh, two faces start doing that on it. So open oh. up and let some sludge in there. Yeah. 